just a, as, a, as a matter of background, in 2014, the United Nations Human Rights Council created an open-ended intergovernmental working group with a mandate to elaborate an international legally binding instrument to regulate in international human rights law the activities of transnational corporations and other business enterprises. This reignited debates not only on whether a binding instrument was desirable or not, but also what shape a BHR treaty should take. So, um, speaking first, we have uh, Dr. Nadia Bernas. Uh, Dr. Nadia Bernas is an associate professor of law at Wageningen, Wageningen University in the Netherlands and a visiting professor at the Catholic University of Lille in France. She's the author of the book Business and Human Rights, History, Law and Policy, and of numerous academic articles in law and business journals. She founded and runs Right As Usual, a blog dedicated to business and human rights. And we also have uh, Dr. Clara Metzen O'Brien. She's a senior researcher at the Danish Institute for Human Rights and lecturer and Baxter Fellow at the University of Dundee School of Law, where she established and directs the LLM on business and human rights. Her recent publications include Business and Human Rights, a Handbook for Legal Practitioners, and Public Procurement and Human Rights, Opportunities, Risks, and Dilemmas for the State as a Buyer. She's also the author of the draft text for a Business and Human Rights Framework Convention. Thank you very much, both of you, for uh, joining us today. And I give the floor to Dr. Nadia Bernat. Thank you very much, Danilo. So I'm sharing myself, yeah? I think that's what we said, so hold on. Um, here. Um, yeah, sounds okay. great. Uh, so I now can only see you, uh, Danilo, so you have to tell me if something happens because, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you, Danilo, for your uh, um, kind introduction and uh, invitation to speak today. Um, so I've prepared a PowerPoint, I guess, perhaps uh, not being too original here. Um, and uh, I'm really happy to talk uh, today about uh, treaty making in business and human rights. Um, so I want to say a few words about the context, I think by way of introduction uh, uh, for this talk. And then I'm going to briefly present these four models of corporate accountability that uh, I've developed in, in, a, in an article that I recently published. Uh, so obviously uh, a summary of that uh, because we don't have a lot of time. Um, and then I'll say a few words about uh, the future and uh, looking ahead uh, on, this, uh, on this issue. Um, so like I said, um, this talk, and I guess the invitation uh, is uh, based on the publication of uh, two articles last year in 2020. Uh, one uh, looking at uh, comparing the business and human rights treaty making process with uh, the deep seabed mining regime in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea that was published in the Business and Human Rights Journal. Um, and then later in 2020, um, I published this piece about models for a business and human rights treaty in human rights, uh, human rights review. And that's uh, at least the one in human rights review is open access. So if people want to uh, want to have a look at this. Um, so the context, um, I think, is important uh, to this discussion. Uh, this year, as probably most people uh, listening uh, know, um, it's the 10 year anniversary of the adoption of the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights. And uh, I like to think that the adoption of the UNGPs was uh, a milestone in many ways, especially in the historical, if you put them in their historical context, but also for many, um, uh, for many people, it was seen as a huge disappointment. I'm not gonna go back to why and how, I think many things have been written on this already, um, but 
I think it's okay, and at least I see it as okay to acknowledge that it can be both of these things, um, and uh, that's that's fine. That thing that's part of the context. Uh, for me, what really stands out, and I think what is important to say when starting to discussing the treaty and what uh, what the treaty can be about, uh, a very important uh, aspect of this, I think, is that business and human rights has become a really broad field with uncertain boundaries. And I think there's a lot of people who are working in this area and they do very different things. So I've listed here uh, on the slide a few of the issues that I think in my view fall under the business and human rights umbrella. And I think anybody can see here uh, how those are just very different issues. Uh, there's the more corporate side of things, corporate compliance, there's the um, uh, issues of gender, issues of reparations, investment law, all of those um, areas um, intersect with business and human rights, but they're also very different in nature and have very different, uh, raise very different problems. So I think that's important because to me, that leads to a question that I'm sure many people who work on the treaty have asked themselves before, and that is what exactly can a treaty achieve? Because of all these sub areas that business and human rights touches upon, inevitably, we have to make choices uh, for this treaty to see the light of day. Otherwise, we're basically trying to fix capitalism and the excesses of capitalism through a treaty, which I honestly don't think is possible. So um, I think that's something that I always keep in mind when discussing the treaty, that there's only so much you can do through an international legal instrument negotiated in the United Nations. It's just the reality of it. Um, so guided by this question, what exactly can a treaty achieve? I have focused myself uh, and my, my, my research in the past couple of years has really focused on what can, how can we add value to the existing legal framework? And for me, the key issue there is, one of the key issues anyway, is uh, corporate accountability uh, under international law and how the treaty can, could, maybe should uh, strengthen uh, what we already have and add value to what we already have in this area at the international level. And uh, I came up with these models, which I'm going to briefly describe here, uh, because that's the way I was thinking about it in my head uh, when trying to think about, okay, what can this be bring to the discussion of direct human rights obligations for corporations, of corporate accountability under international law generally. What are the options there? So that's how I came up with these models, which of course are woman-made. Uh, that you know, I, I just I just designed them. So yeah, it, it it's it's uh, it has no no normative value, of course. Um, but um, just so I just want to briefly present them and maybe uh, introduce some points of comparison. Uh, the first model that, um, that I describe also in the article is the UNGP's model. And that essentially is corporate accountability seen as do no harm. So no positive obligation to contribute to the realization of human rights um or to the realization of the SDGs, for example, but more a, a negative uh, obligation and actually not an obligation as such, but a social expectation, something which is not grounded in international law, but seen as a social expectation. So as it is in uh, pillar two of the uh, of the UNGPs. And currently the draft that we have, uh, the draft uh, treaty basically follows this model, uh, the same language as in the UNGPs is used. And uh, the idea that have a responsibility to action rights is put in the preamble. Uh, 
of the of the draft and not in the core uh, part of the of the treaty. So uh, very little, very little change there, except that of course it's in a treaty, so you know perhaps it carries more legitimacy. But from a strict normative point of view, there would be no difference with the UNGPs on this question of corporate accountability. Um, the second model that I described in this article is the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights model. And there, um, based on the UDHR, we have a wider type of accountability. It's not just do no harm, but the language is more about indeed promoting human rights um, and for all, you know, the sort of really uh, universal declaration language, really, uh, of course, inclusive, etc. Um, so wider type of accountability grounded in international law to the extent that we can say that the UDHR is international law. Of course, it is soft law, but it's also symbolically very important. So I think from the perspective of human rights law, it's clear that the UDHR, in my view, carries more weight than the UNGPs. Uh, so I, I'm putting it on a, on a different scale. But normatively speaking, I think uh, we could discuss that uh, perhaps in more detail. Um, so grounded in international law, but of course with no specific enforcement mechanism and uh, a model that in fact uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't add too much uh, uh, doesn't add too much to the to the discussion or to what we already have anyway. Um, so moving on to the last two models, um, the progressive model and the transformative model. A progressive model of corporate accountability would be, in my view, grounded in international law, creating um, a general obligation for corporations um, to respect human rights. Uh, to not infringe on human rights, basically using the language of the UNGPs, but grounding this into uh, international law via the treaty uh, that, is, uh, that is negotiated. Um, and in this model, we would still rely on domestic enforcement mechanisms, including some facilities, some facilitation of extraterritorial uh, cases, um, and perhaps tackling some of the obstacles that have arisen, um, um, jurisdictional matters uh, in particular, but without, let's say, an international court uh, to deal with uh, to deal with human rights uh, violations by corporations. And then finally, the transformative model, which of course is the most ambitious and the one that would lead to uh, the most um, change in what we already have is similar to the progressive model, but with international enforcement mechanisms in the form of a court or some kind of body, or maybe the International Criminal Court. Um, uh, having jurisdiction over corporations or these kind of, of mechanisms, which of course have implications, I think, outside of the treaty itself, and is perhaps more, uh, perhaps more difficult to, um, uh, yeah, perhaps more difficult to uh, to implement. So in this in this work I've done in this past year, I've I've said that. Um, uh, my preference uh, would be for the progressive model uh, for various reasons, uh, um, which I'm going to try to explain now in my final, uh, in my final slide. Um, why do I think this is the best model? Um, first, because I think the human rights obligations of corporations really is a core issue that I don't think the treaty can avoid addressing this question and actually taking a stand on this question. We've been discussing that now for a very long time and not just in academia. I think the, yes, I think it's time to take a stand on this issue. And I think the treaty is the opportunity to do that. So 
that's the reason why I would favor the progressive model, creating direct obligations for corporations via the treaty. I also think that this is an issue which is suitable to include in an international human rights treaty. At the end of the day, all these issues intersect, uh, the, 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 the business and human rights issues intersect with other areas of law, for example, investment law. Um, and yes, I think there's some discussions also in the investment legal field about including human rights provisions in bilateral investment treaties or uh, in, uh, in, in more in, in uh, uh, broader investment agreements. And that's okay, and I think we should encourage that, but at the end of the day, if we're going to create international human rights obligations for certain actors, I think it should come from international human rights law, and therefore this treaty is just the, 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 the right medium to at least start doing this. That's not to say that it cannot happen somewhere else later on. I also strongly believe that this is a once in a generation opportunity. I, I think if we get a treaty that, that, is, that is not embracing, um, that, that doesn't address uh, the, the question of, of human rights obligations for corporations, then there won't be another opportunity. Of course, I'm making this up, but I, I'd like to think there won't be another opportunity for at least 20 years. Um, so this is this is basically now, <laughs> and I, I really feel that urgency uh, that to not give up on that uh, on that particular goal. Um, and the 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 point I want to end with is this idea that, and and maybe some people listening uh, to this uh, webinar have read some of this literature about direct human rights obligations for corporations and how controversial also it has been, um, especially I think in the early days of, of business and human rights as a field. And uh, my general message on this is that I don't really don't think it's the radical move that people think it is. Um, I think it's simply adapting uh, international law to the reality, which is that corporations can and do uh, have huge impacts on, on the realization of human rights. And it is just this artificial way of presenting things, pretending that states are responsible for everything is, is just not right. It just doesn't, doesn't really make sense to me anymore. Um, and, um, to, to, to show that it's, it's not such a radical move. I, I've made that point in my piece, uh, comparing the, the business and human rights treaty making uh, process with the convention on the law of the sea, in which if you read carefully the text, uh, companies um, are basically direct obligations are placed on companies in this text, uh, broad obligation to to not damage the environment and to protect human life. It's very loose language, you know, we're not getting into details of due diligence and reporting or anything like that. But it's just this simple fact that if you do business somewhere, you have to be careful about the environment and people, which I really don't think is such a big ask. Um, so that's my, these are my um, ideas about the treaty. I really think we should seize this opportunity um, and uh, I thank you for listening. And I went over by one minute. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia. No, it was a, a perfect use of the time. Um, and thank you, especially for, for the last point on, on how non controversial this issue of direct obligations should be. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes it is. I would like to uh, now give the floor to Dr. Uh, Clara Mappen O'Brien. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, um, <clears throat> Danilo and the Ultimate Business Human Rights Network for inviting me to speak with you today. Of course, I have a trip back to state, everyone. Hope you've got your green on and preparing to enjoy uh, as your circumstances permit. I'm going to focus my comments today around two main points. Uh, the first one is that the approach embodied by the current treaty draft cannot uh, succeed. That's my assessment. 
Um, and the second main point is that there is an alternative approach available that could succeed and which is also better. Um, so my first point, the current approach will not succeed. Um, and that's the approach I take to be embodied in the, the second revised draft. Um, I understand that this can be uh, a difficult view to hear for many of those who are campaigning for a treaty and who've contributed in various ways to the process. Um, but it's because, like you, I myself do want to see, and I think like Nadia, an effective uh, binding international instrument on business and human rights, that I feel that it's best uh, to be direct and honest in my assessment, which is that the second revised draft is deficient in ways which go beyond the level of draftsmanship to its overall approach and design, uh, and which entails that it has actually no real chance of delivering the advances in protection and remediation that we all seek. This is because the text embodies a regulatory project, which uh, I see to be not coherent, uh, is trying to do something, actually a number of things, which through its chosen legal form, UN Human Rights Treaty, it's not uh, going to be able to do. So to elaborate a little further on this, um, the main objective of the draft, uh, to which the majority of the substantive uh, content is addressed, is to facilitate transnational civil claims as form of remedy for corporate harm to human rights and also so-called environmental rights, not yet defined, um, linked to corporate due diligence failures. Consequently, the text makes detailed provision regarding not just the scope and the content of corporate human rights due diligence, see here Article 6.3, um, and how states should require this, Article 6.2, but also how due diligence failures should be linked uh, to liability in Article 8. Um, it also addresses how, in the context of such claims, national courts should be required to handle matters such as jurisdiction, forum, applicable law, recognition and enforcement of judgments, statutes of limitation, and so on. That's Articles 8 to 12. Such detailed rules, uh, as it prescribes, can work for a narrow category of harm that generally occurs within a relatively stable pattern of facts, where the kind of actors involved, their relationships are held constant across cases. And this is why I don't see um, a strong analogy in the rules on oil pollution, damage at sea or deep seabed mining, um, under state sponsorship on the high seas that uh, Nadia refers to in her article present. Yeah, I don't see those as presenting a good analogy to the general business and human rights scenario. Rules of a narrow scope or that address technical matters within specific domains can be deep reaching. But however much we want to advance the horizon of corporate accountability, I would expect anybody putting a lawyer's glasses on automatically to be asking how this could be viable if the basis of liability is harm to human rights as such where human rights are defined very broadly to incorporate emotional suffering, economic loss, um, with reference to an open list of human rights instruments that in turn consist of open-ended norms. And anywhere within an infinite, within an infinite set of actors who are linked together merely by business relationships. How can we do that without inevitably through an international legal instrument without inevitably inviting objections in terms of cardinal principles of any legal regime, such as in relation to legal certainty or legality, due process, judicial comity, and sovereignty. Um, the purposive and dynamic character of norms contained in human rights treaties is not normally a problem. Of course, it's actually a virtue in terms of sustaining their relevance. Um, and generally speaking, that's because the duty bearer is a sovereign state assumed to enjoy legislative, judicial and executive functions within a delimited territory. The obligations are, are territorially or jurisdictionally delimited with reference to a fixed set of instruments. States are afforded a margin of appreciation in the manner in which they implement their obligations, which includes, of course, balancing conflicting 
qualified human rights. And claims are brought before supervisory mechanisms whose jurisdiction is supplementary to those of states as primary duty bearers and subject to requirements, for instance, of exhaustion of local remedies. But as soon as we move beyond relatively constant and simple fact patterns, such as those entailed in relation to physical harm to property or the person resulting from a company's own operations, uh, combining, sorry, combining civil liability for harm to human rights linked to due diligence failures results not in just constructively ambiguous rules, but a regime that you could even call super indeterminate. And I think that is bound to remain true um, under this scheme, even if, which seems unlikely in the near future, somehow magically we're able to solve or address the other lacunae and uncertainties of public international law and private law that stand in the way of perfecting the regime envisaged by the draft treaty, such as those connected to attribution, rules of attribution of in international law, uh, shared responsibility as between public and private actors, rules on joint and several liability, um, and of course how, as Nadia also alluded to, this treaty's provisions would interact with international trade investment labor regimes and so on. And finally, even if we can imagine such problems as being capable of a technical solution, which I think is arguable, the treaty text would be required to anticipate all the relevant eventualities while accommodating the range of diversity of national legal regimes will be so complex and not to mention long as to be, I would say, incapable of comprehension, let alone consistent application, unless perhaps by some super race of Vulcan jurists. Um, so in a nutshell, the problem derives from seeking to establish a scope that is both wide and deep at the same time. And the resulting text, the second wise draft, does not look like other human rights treaties. Um, and here the Convention on Enforced Disappearances or the Istanbul Convention are not good analogies either. I think the obligations they provide for more detail, but again, the subject matter is more specific and narrow. And the human rights treaties we have to we have look the way they do for a reason, which is the more prescriptive the text becomes, the smaller is the state group of states who are able to accept it. In this sense, I think we should understand the US's comment during the previous session that the draft pursues an unworkable one size fits all approach, putting bluntly a point expressed uh, more diplomatically but consistently by other delegations. And what's more, it's a point that aligns with scholarly observations about international treaty making and regulatory regimes. And here I refer to the work, for instance, of John Braithwaite and Peter Drahals. Barbara Karemanos, Romeo de Berka, and Malcolm Langford, and Troy Kierkegaard, amongst others. And if my analysis of theirs is correct, it's not really very surprising that most states seem unconvinced of the legal and diplomatic viability of this project. Besides the United States, China, Russia, the EU, Brazil, Mexico, Japan, Indonesia, Canada, Australia, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, have all voiced sustained reservations of fundamental character. With these countries and their economic actors outside the regime of the treaty, even if it, a treaty along current lines gained the support necessary to open for signature, its practical significance would remain negligible, an outcome which has befallen other instruments at UN level. And it might never, even if it never entered into Force, it could still take up the available space for a UN business and human rights treaty, perhaps in perpetuity. So, what to do? It might seem that after six years, we've traveled too far down the road to change course and seek a better outcome. But I'm not so fatalistic. I believe another better way forward is possible, and which does not entail either drastically narrowing the scope. Of the instrument, for instance, as previously recommended by John Ruggie, to, for instance, gross human rights violations, or on the other hand, to transnational corporations only, which is what the current treaty supporters still seek to do. Um, 
and it doesn't entail either actually lowering the level of ambition in terms of strengthening prevention, protection, access to remedy, um, or corporate accountability. And I believe all these elements could actually be secured through a treaty along the lines of the draft that I published last year. Uh, in certain respects, it resembles and takes inspiration from framework conventions. And in summary, it has three main elements. The first is a legal duty on states' parties to implement the protect, respect, remedy framework and the guiding principles. In addition, it specifies state duties to develop additional measures, procedures, and guidelines to promote the implementation of the treaty and its fundamental objective, and to involve stakeholders to that end. Periodically, to review and evaluate national law policies and practices um, and their implementation of the UN framework and guiding principles. States are further required to adopt national action plans or other strategies and to support experience sharing, monitoring and evaluation nationally, regionally and at the global level. As its third main element, the treaty would establish a conference of state parties to support uh, its effective implementation through guidance, recommendations addressed to specific industry sectors, specific value chains, specific commodities, technologies or at-risk groups. What would be the merits of this instrument and approach? I'm just going to mention five. First, it would align to the UN framework and guiding principles. And there isn't time to discuss this in detail, but I do see this as a merit in principle because the UN guiding principles and framework are broadly consistent with insights which I take to be valid uh, in the domains of polycentric regulation, multilevel governance theory, and different studies uh, exploring the mechanisms of the effectiveness of human rights treaties. Second, however, in strategic terms, in taking the UN framework and guiding principles as its foundation, this model would also be likely to enjoy stronger cross-regional and cross-stakeholder support and would harvest and not squander the already vast investment of resources and time in the guiding principles by national governments, businesses, civil society organizations, and other bodies around the world over the last 10 years. Third, the model is flexible enough to accommodate the diversity of national legal systems um, and economic circumstances across states. While it wouldn't then pose barriers to entry for states who, for instance, national due diligence legislation is still a remote prospect or who don't apply the criminal law to legal persons, it would still be able to drive progress and to some extent convergence on key elements of national regulatory frameworks. Fourth, it provides the scope to generate more prescriptive, deeper reaching rules on specific topics based on sustained dialogue, analysis, and negotiation amongst relevant stakeholders. And like Nadia, I'd just like to ask the participants to reflect if you are currently closely following um, current developments on transnational tort litigation linked to human rights abuses. Perhaps people in this network are, it's a hot topic for the Oxford um, Business Human Rights Tech Network, I know. But are you also closely following and knowledgeable on norms, standards, and cases um, linked to labor rights in the big economy, tech giants, privacy and freedom of expression on the internet, artificial intelligence, tailing scams, conflict minerals in the renewable sector, non-financial reporting, blockchain, trade agreements, corporate governance and directors' duties, and the role of businesses in the pandemic and the opioids crisis. It's very unlikely, I think, that anyone is actually managing to stay abreast across business and human rights related dialogue, discussions and standards in all those fields. The field is one now of mind boggling uh, breadth and complexity. Yet a business and uh, international business and human rights treaty should have the scope to generate norms and guidance across these topics and to provide a basis for scrutinizing state and company conduct in all these areas. And as well, it should have the potential to trigger the multi-actor, longer range regulatory responses that are needed to address root causes for complex business and human rights problems, such as those targeted by the Bangladesh court. Fifth and last, the UN human rights system is the only arena of 
where the cumulative injustices embodied in existing laws, uh, social and economic arrangements and distributed outcomes can be reckoned at the global level and challenged with reference to the equal dignity and rights of all human beings. Activating that system to speak truth to and to discipline not just state power but also corporate power is a step which is long overdue. We won't achieve that goal in my assessment with the current model for the reasons that I've outlined. We can achieve that goal, however, with this model, which is attracting growing interest from states and other actors. I just add in that context that I have been asked to present on this uh, framework convention approach to a large meeting of state representatives convened by the United States and Japan last year um, on the fringes of the treaty session uh, by the European Parliament and a, a number of other European Union actors. Even Ecuador's foreign minister, when he was representative uh, in Geneva, identified the framework convention as a possible point of convergence and reiterated the need for cooperation across regional blocs when he spoke to the European Parliament himself during the last uh, session of the Intergovernmental Working Group. Uh, in face of the current impasse in the IGWIG and given the unprecedented global challenges that human society now faces, I think those are signals that we cannot afford to ignore. 